Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS Division of Tribal Affairs, in partnership with Center of, um, and I would like to welcome everyone to the webinar of the All Tribes Consultation Webinar on Medical Medicaid Unwinding. My name is Michaela Holm, and I work with Kaufman Associates, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we begin, I'd like to highlight the main features of your Zoom webinar interface. First, the presentation slides are on the main window and speakers will appear on the top just above the presentation. At the bottom of your screen is the Zoom menu bar. Here you'll find the Q&A box. We encourage you to use this feature to submit any questions at any point during the webinar and we'll leave time for Q&A questions to address all questions at the end. At the bottom of your menu bar, you'll also find a chat box. Please use the chat box to report any technical issues you may be experiencing. We will respond to those concerns as they come in. Another menu option is the raised hand icon. Please use this feature when you would like for us to unmute your line to ask questions during the Q&A segment. And additionally, live captioning is available during today's broadcast. Simply click the CC icon on the bottom of your menu bar for this feature. Finally, please be aware that today's webinar is being recorded and that the recording will be made available online in the near future on gocms.gov slash AIAN. With those announcements na named, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar and I'll turn it over to Beverly. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Beverly Lofton. I'm a senior policy advisor in the Division of Tribal Affairs. Welcome to today's All Tribes webinar on Medicaid Unwinding. The purpose of this webinar today is to provide an overview of the guidance CMS released that outlines the requirements and expectations for states to restore eligibility and enrollment operations for Medicaid beneficiaries. We will also discuss strategies to en engage our tribal stakeholders and ensure eligible el individuals remain enrolled in coverage. We are pleased to be joined today by our CMS colleagues from the Division of Enrollment and Policy Operations. Today we have with us Suzette Singh, Shannon Lovejoy, Joseph Weisfeld, and Sarah O'Connor. I will now hand it over to our presenters for today. Thank you, Beverly. If we can go to the next one, please. So as Beverly mentioned, um, we're very excited for the opportunity today to discuss efforts for Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program agencies as they're restoring routine operations when the public health emergency eventually ends. And this is a process that at CMS we refer to as unwinding. Um, as Beverly mentioned today, my colleagues and I will provide a quick overview of some new resources that are available to states and stakeholders and we'll also provide a more detailed walkthrough of our new state health official letter that we released in March, which outlines expectations for states. So you know, um, so you may know what will happen during the unwinding period and how it will impact Medicaid and SHIP beneficiaries. And then we'll open up the discussion for questions that you may have. Next slide, please. So in March, we released quite a number of new guidance and tools that are designed to help states really plan for the unwinding period. And some of these tools are ones that can be used by stakeholders. So in addition to this new state health official letter, we've released planning tools for states to help them in their efforts to identify areas of work that they'll need to address during the unwinding period, as well as um, strategies that they can take to mitigate any challenges. We're also very excited that our Office of Communications has been working on some messaging that states and stakeholders can use. And last month, the, um, they released a communications toolkit that helps provide insights and key messages that can help states and other stakeholders educate Medicaid and CHIP enrollees about upcoming changes. I do want to mention that the social media graphics and other materials that are in the communications toolkit are currently being updated. And when we release the update, it will include tribal graphics and specific messaging for American Indian and Alaska Native Medicaid and CHIP beneficiaries. We know that these beneficiaries see their local Indian healthcare provider as a trusted source. So we're really encouraging these beneficiaries to check with their local Indian healthcare providers 
um, and as well as their state Medicaid agencies to make sure that they are providing updated contact information as this will be critical um, in uh, efforts to, um, to unwind and um, renewals of eligibility that will occur during the unwinding period. So just to let you know, to look for some of that information in the near future. Next slide, please. And then a few of the last resources we've recently released include some different decks that include strategies that states can take to um, really um, you know, work through the unwinding process and anticipate some of the challenges. So we have some decks related to working with managed care plans, as well as how states can handle some anticipated challenges like the influx of hearing volume. We've also provided states with reporting tools. And these are tools that states will use to send CMS information and data about how they are progressing through their eligibility and enrollment work as they go through the unwinding process. And this will allow us to help keep an eye on how states are going through their work and identify challenges as they're happening in the states. Next slide, please. And with all of that, we also launched a new unwinding landing page on Medicaid.gov. And this is a place where you can find all of the resources that I just walked through, as well as any new um, information that we will release in the coming months that is related to unwinding. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm now gonna start um, with an overview and we'll get into our detailed discussion of the new state health official letter that was released to help provide guidance on restoring routine eligibility and enrollment operations. Next slide, please. So before we get into the guidance, um, just to share some background and context for why CMS is so focused on unwinding and the implications of what is in front of states now. So as you all know, the public health emergency has certainly disrupted our lives um, and is you know, on the Medicaid and CHIP agency level has disrupted routine eligibility and enrollment operations. States have had to adopt a number of flexibilities in order to respond to local outbreaks. They've dealt with challenges that I think all um, have dealt with in their states such as state home orders, workforce shortages, and of course, there were also some new federal policies that were available that states have implemented. As a result, um, Medicaid and CHIP program enrollment has grown to nearly 86 million individuals. Um, and this number we know is continuing to increase and we hope to release new updated numbers um, any day now. But this coverage growth that we're seeing in Medicaid and CHIP is in large part due to legislation that was passed in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And in this legislation, states were asked to maintain continuous enrollment of most Medicaid beneficiaries through the last day of the month in which the public health emergency ends in order to receive a temporary 6.2 percentage point increase in federal matching dollars. And since um, you know, all states are claiming this increased funding, states have maintained coverage for almost all Medicaid enrollees. And this, um, is part of the reason why we have been so focused on unwinding because many states have had to stop their regular processing of renewals of eligibility um, in order to make sure that they're maintaining enrollment. And of course, with the program growth, we also know that states will have, um, have more enrollees than they've ever had before. So when they do resume renewals, it's going to be a much higher work volume than states have been accustomed to in the past. And as we head into this unwinding period, we really wanna make sure that states are restoring their operations in a manner that's promoting continuity of coverage for eligible individuals and facilitating seamless coverage transitions for those who become eligible for other coverage insurance programs. Next slide, please. So to help states in their efforts, we released a new state health official letter that really is part of a series of guidance and builds upon other um, state health official letters we released back in December of 2020 and August of 2021. The most recent letter really builds on the specific eligibility and enrollment guidance that we've released to states and provides additional clarifications to states related to the timelines that they have to restore routine operations, how they can distribute renewals across their unwinding period, and how states can adopt strategies and take up some new options that really are intended to protect beneficiaries as well as mitigate churn and allow states to smoothly transition individuals who become eligible for other coverage programs. 
this guidance along with all of the other guidance that CMS has released doesn't actually signal when the federal public health emergency will end, but rather it's intended to help states in their planning efforts for the eventual end of the public health emergency. Next slide, please. So in order to address, address the large volume of work that states will have before them, states will need to develop a comprehensive plan to help restore routine operations in their Medicaid, CHIP, and basic health programs. And this unwinding operational plan is really intended for states to figure out how they're going to address all of these eligibility and enrollment actions in a manner that prevents erroneous coverage losses for individuals, make sure that states are establishing a renewal schedule that's sustain sustainable in future years and doesn't just work for the unwinding period, and that puts the states back on a path to processing renewals and applications in a timely manner. We are strongly encouraging states to work with stakeholders like you as they are developing these plans and of course, as they implement these plans. So please feel free to reach out to your states um, and we hope many of them have been working with you already as they're thinking through how they're going to address all their eligibility and enrollment work. Next slide, please. So in the guidance, we've outlined several different timelines that states will have to restore their operations. So now we are encouraging states to make sure that they are processing applications as expeditiously as possible. And we um, do know that states, that this is important. Well, so we do know that this is important because states um, you know, need to make sure that new applicants are able to timely enroll in coverage. And this is especially critical for individuals that may have chronic healthcare needs. Um, but we also know that states receive applications on a rolling basis. And so almost all states will have some applications that they need to process when the public health emergency ends. And for those states that um, are not quite on track to timely processing applications, we're providing them a phased approach to restore routine application processing and they will have up to four months after the month in which the public health emergency ends to resume timely processing of all applications if they can't get there before then. Next slide, please. So the state health official letter really provided a lot of new guidance and clarifying guidance around a 12 month timeline that we first announced in the August 2020 state health official letter. So we told states that we would provide them with 12 months to complete post-enrollment verifications, redeterminations that may occur in between renewals based on changes in circumstances and periodic renewals of eligibility. And the guidance that we've released is really intended to help states take into account the time it takes for them to process renewals for a group of people. So most states take approximately 60 to 90 days to process renewals for a group of individuals. This includes the time it takes for a state to initiate the renewal process by checking available data sources and information that the state has and see if they can use that information to renew eligibility without needing to contact the individual. This 60 to 90 day period also needs to include the time that it would take for states to send out renewal forms for those individuals for whom they need to get additional information from in order to complete the renewal, as well as the time to verify and go through the return to information and make sure that they're determining eligibility on all bases and Medicaid in particular before they decide that someone is no longer eligible for coverage. So to help better account for this process, we've told states that they will have 12 months to initiate all renewals for their entire Medicaid and CHIP caseload. And this is all individuals enrolled in Medicaid and CHIP prior to the unwinding period. We are also providing states two additional months on the back end, so a total of 14 months total, to complete the work that they've initiated during the unwinding period. We've also told states that they can start their 12 month unwinding period up to two months before the end of the month in which the public health emergency ends. So what this results in is essentially a three month window of time in which states may start their unwinding period. So they can start their unwinding period the month before the month in which the public health emergency ends, the month in which the public health emergency ends, or the month after the month in which the public health emergency ends. So for a quick example, if the public health emergency were to end in July, states could choose to start their unwinding period in June, July, or August. 
Now, what this means in this 12 month period is that once states start this process, these are, um, you know, in some states, if they've stopped their process altogether, this means that for the first time in quite a while, many beneficiaries are going to start to get renewal notices. For some, it might be a letter that says that their renewal, their eligibility is going to be continued. For others, they may be getting renewal forms that say that they need to return information to the state um, in order to uh, maintain their coverage. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So in this next slide, this is just a visual representation of what I just walked through in terms of the options that states have in order um, to start their unwinding period. So in this example, we have a state that generally takes approximately 60 days to, um, to complete the renewal process for a group of individuals. And in this example, we're also just making the assumption that the public health emergency ends in July for the purposes of this example only. So option A, which is this first line with the arrow, represents a state that is choosing to start its unwinding period in June based on the example that the public health emergency is ending in July. Option B shows what the unwinding period would look like in a state that chooses to start its unwinding period in July. And in option C, this represents an example of a state that's choosing to begin its unwinding period in August. Mm -hmm. As you will see in all of these examples, there's a couple of things that are the same across, no matter what time a state starts their unwinding period. One, all states will get the full 12 months to initiate the renewals. They will also get the two months on the back end to complete the work that they have initiated. And then the other thing that's important to note, even if a state is selecting option A, which is the earliest a state could begin its unwinding period, states still have to make sure that they are maintaining coverage through the end of the month in which the public health emergency ends in order to claim that temporary increased FMAP, which means regardless, the first terminations in this example could not occur before August, um, August 1st in this example. The other thing to note is that June in this example in option A is the earliest a state could start their process. So renewals that were conducted before June um, if those renewals, if anyone was found ineligible, the state would need to redo that renewal again at some point during the 12 month unwinding period before they could take any final action on a case for an individual and terminate coverage. Next slide, please. So we've also been pretty clear with states, um, which gets to the last point I made in the last slide that when states really start resuming routine operations and start conducting renewals again during the unwinding period, that they still must follow all of the renewal requirements that are outlined in federal regulation. So that means that they must you know, attempt to renew eligibility based on available information, that they must make sure that they're providing a renewal form for those individuals who, um, whose eligibility can't be renewed based on the available information, and for individuals whose eligibility is based off of um, income or modified adjusted gross income, that renewal form must be pre-populated and the individual must have a minimum of 30 days to respond to that form. So all of these protections that are built into the renewal process must continue to ma be maintained during the unwinding period. We've also told states that even if they conducted a renewal during the public health emergency and found someone ineligible, they need to make sure that they're conducting a new renewal for that individual during the unwinding period. And this will ensure that any final determination of eligibility is based on the most recent information that's available to the state, um, as well as making sure that the state has enough information to redetermine eligibility on all bases in case the individual might be eligible for coverage under a different eligibility group. Next slide, please. So we've also um, told states that we're expecting them to adopt a risk-based approach to prioritize how they're going to work through their work um, during the unwinding period. And so um, states have four approaches that they can choose from. So the first approach is a population-based approach where states may prioritize or deprioritize cases for populations with certain characteristics where individuals may be more likely to be eligible for expansive benefits or for different coverage. So for example, some states are considering completing new renewals first during, earlier during the unwinding period 
for individuals who they may have already previously found ineligible at some point during the PHG and trying to conduct those renewals again first. Um, some states are considering other authorities. So for example, we know some states are looking to extend postpartum coverage and some states may choose to deprioritize work for some pregnant individuals to make sure that individuals aren't losing coverage before some of these new coverage options go into effect in the state. However, the thing with this particular approach is that states are not able to prioritize populations um, in, um, based on available federal matching rate or prioritize populations in a manner that would constitute a violation of federal law. The second approach a state could take is what we're calling a time-based approach. And this means that they could decide to prioritize cases based on the age of the case. So for example, they could process cases earlier during the unwinding period that have gone the longest without a renewal first. Or we know that some states may look to maintain a person's original month of renewal and keep the initial like renewal schedule for those individuals and distribute the work that way. The third risk-based option states have is a hybrid approach, which is kind of a combined approach between the population and time-based approaches. And states can also develop their own approach to work through cases. And from what we've heard, most states are using some sort of, or planning to use some sort of hybrid approach, at least from what we can tell now, where they may do some work for certain populations first, or deprioritize work for other populations, and then distribute their work based on the age of the case that's remaining. Next slide, please. So when a state identifies how they're going to approach their work during the unwinding period, they're going to need to think through how they're going to distribute that work across their 12 month unwinding period. And we've been trying to encourage states to do what they can to evenly or come as close to evenly distributing their renewal work over the 12 month unwinding period to really mitigate against future challenges the state may experience. So we're trying to make sure that states take their time to methodically um, go through their work over their unwinding period so they're preventing erroneous coverage losses. But because renewals for most beneficiaries occur only once every 12 months, once someone's eligibility is renewed, that renewal cycle tends to stick with the individual in future years. So we really want to make sure that states are coming out of this unwinding period in better shape than they were in going in and that they have workloads that are sustainable in future years. The one thing to note is that when states are distributing work, we've been pretty clear that they may not shorten a beneficiary's eligibility period um, in order to achieve a more distribution renewal. That means if someone's eligibility has been renewed at some point during the public health emergency and they're due for renewal at some point during the unwinding period, the state can't do their renewal too soon or sooner than they otherwise would have for the purposes of distributing their work across the unwinding period. Next slide, please. And to help make sure um, states are really doing what they can to prevent erroneous coverage losses, we've been encouraging states to initiate no more than one ninth of their total caseload of renewals in a given month. So we know that there are some natural fluctuations that occur with renewal volume from year to year. For example, during open enrollment, states may get more applications in, more people enrolled in coverage, and therefore more renewals are due in future years in those open enrollment months. So we know that states aren't going to achieve a perfect distribution of renewals over their 12 month unwinding period. And we know that there are reasons why states may have more renewals in a particular month. But we're trying to encourage states to the extent that they can to really utilize the full 12 month unwinding period. And I will say, I know we covered a lot of information on like how states are thinking about distributing work and how they might prioritize their work during the unwinding period. And a lot of that is just to say the implication of this, and we'll get to a little bit this um, more in our conversation today, is that you know, we know that once the unwinding period starts, that renewals will begin, that many individuals haven't had a renewal in quite a while and haven't had to respond to a renewal form. But one of the challenges is that we know that states need to really distribute their work. And so we won't know exactly which individuals will come up for renewal in a given month. And so we've been trying to think through you know, messaging that can work for, to let people know, to make sure that their you know, uh, contact information is updated so that the state can reach them when they do send out the renewal form and trying our best to give um, individuals a heads up about what to expect 
when we don't know exactly when they need to expect to see these forms coming in from the state. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna shift gears and start talking about some of the strategies that we're making available to states to help promote continuity of coverage and to help mitigate churn. And I'm gonna turn the conversation over to my colleague, Joe Weisfeld. Great, thank you, Shannon. Um, I am Joe Weisfeld, as Shannon mentioned, uh, for also from the Division of Enrollment Policy and Operations at CMS. Uh, and I'm gonna walk through a few strategies to promote continuity of care and of coverage and mitigate churn uh, as we move towards this unwinding period. Uh, next slide, please. So one strategy that states can take uh, during the public health emergency is to update contact information to help prevent coverage losses. A hugely beneficial partner in this endeavor is the state's managed care plans. States should uh, work with their managed care plans with regards to outreach efforts uh, and establishing processes uh, to receive and update contact information uh, from the managed care plans. Uh, so specifically, states may treat in-state contact information from plans as uh, reliable for purposes of updating a beneficiary record. Um, and so uh, in that process, the, that information can be used provided that a state sends a notice to the address on file and provides a beneficiary uh, a reasonable period of time to verify contact information. Um, with this uh, approach, even if a beneficiary does not respond to that notice uh, to uh, verify their updated contact information from the plan, um, the state may update uh, the beneficiary record uh, with that new contact information. Uh, again, with this approach, the state will need to ensure that the contact information was uh, directly received by the beneficiary or verified uh, by the beneficiary, and it cannot be come from a third party. Uh, next slide. Uh, in a very similar approach, uh, States can also use uh, the United States Postal Service uh, by way of the National Change of Address Database or mail that is returned with an in-state forwarding address. Uh, I'm gonna start with the NCOA or National Change of Address Database. Um, the NCOA is a uh, set of data that includes uh, permanent change of address records maintained by the United States Postal Service. So every time an individual or family moves and submits a change of address form uh, to their local post office, that address is recorded in the NCOA database. States are able to establish agreements with, the, uh, with USPS to gain access to this database in order to utilize uh, these address changes uh, and to help update their, uh, their own records. Uh, states can also leverage uh, information from uh, in-state, uh, from return mail from USPS with an in-state forwarding address. So uh, when states receive this information, in, they can use it in the very similar way that I described uh, from uh, information received from managed care organizations. Uh, so that is uh, the information obtained from NCOA or USPS in state forwarding can be treated as reliable and the state can update the beneficiary record provided that uh, they send a notice to the individual's address on file and provide a, allow a reasonable period of time for the individual to verify the accuracy of that contact information. And again, if that individual does not respond to that notice, state can still update that uh, information. Next slide, please. So as uh, states prepare to restore routine operations as Shannon spoke to, uh, we're working uh, closely with uh, states and stakeholders to identify ways to efficiently enroll individuals and reduce churn. Uh, one approach is through temporary 1902 E14A waivers. Uh, by way of background, uh, Section 1902E14A 
of the Social Security Act allows for waivers, quote, as are necessary to ensure that states establish income and eligibility determination systems that protect beneficiaries. Um, so since 2013, CMS has granted these types of waivers to protect beneficiaries access to coverage uh, by providing administrative relief to states when they were facing operational issues such as backlogs and application processing delays. Uh, including uh, states that were navigating serious challenges with their eligibility systems. Uh, to protect beneficiaries uh, in addressing the challenges states may face as we transition towards uh, routine operations as part of unwinding, CMS again has determined that uh, states may seek approval to use these 1902E14A waivers, uh, but they will uh, be in a time limited manner, really uh, coinciding uh, with the unwinding period. So as part of the March state health official letter that Shannon mentioned earlier, we outlined a few strategies that we would consider. Uh, and I'm gonna walk through uh, each of those for you. I'll in note that uh, we've informed states that uh, they're able to request waivers that are not listed here as well. And we will review those uh, with the stipulation that they must protect beneficiaries and be related to the unwinding period. Um, and you'll see that each of these strategies uh, really are narrowly targeted to protect beneficiaries during this unprecedented time uh, and during this transition to routine operations. Uh, and a lot of the, these uh, strategies uh, really aim to attempt to limit the, the need for requests for additional information from beneficiaries with a goal of leading to fewer procedural terminations. Uh, so the first two uh, flexibilities are on this slide. And so uh, I'll start with our SNAP flexibility. So this strategy aims to allow states to leverage SNAP findings to renew Medicaid eligibility for individuals uh, under 65 years old uh, who are receiving SNAP benefits uh, despite the differences uh, in uh, household composition and income counting rules. Uh, those are you know, two of the key distinctions between uh, SNAP and Medicaid. Uh, so this would allow uh, states to use that, uh, those SNAP findings in moving forward with a Medicaid renewal. Um, so, with this strategy, uh, the uh, gross income from, a, from SNAP uh, could be used. Uh, uh, and if the individual was under the applicable uh, modified adjusted gross income or MAGI threshold for Medicaid, uh, they would be able to be renewed by the state. The next strategy on this slide, we often to refer to as our zero income strategy. Um, for this one, I'm gonna start with our current policy before I talk about, uh, before I explain how the E14 works. So currently when a state attempts to conduct an ex parte renewal for an individual who was previously verified to having no income, uh, either at their at application or at a prior renewal, uh, they check their data sources. If the state receives uh, a return of no income uh, from the data sources, that individual cannot be uh, renewed on an ex parte basis because that, that income information is considered to be missing. Under this E14 strategy, a state would be, would be able to complete that ex parte renewal uh, when no income data is returned for individuals who were previously enrolled uh, with a verified attestation of zero income. So uh, a state would not need to request additional income information or documentation uh, from that individual uh, if there was a uh, zero dollar uh, uh, income attestation verified within the last 12 months and no financial data is returned. Um, and I'll even note uh, that 12 month period that is listed on the slide, uh, we've broadened that even further uh, and will uh, permit states to uh, accept an attestation that goes as far back as 12 months prior to the start of the public health emergency, 
or March 2019 uh, to make this flexibility uh, even more useful for states and beneficiaries. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> so the next strategy is our AVS uh, or asset verification system strategy. Um, as a quick refresher, uh, states are required to verify assets using the state's asset verification system or ABS for individuals uh, exempted from modified adjusted gross income or MAGI based methodologies and subject to an asset test. Uh, this uh, ABS test uh, uh, cannot be waived. However, under this E14 strategy, states can temporarily assume that there has been no change in resources that are verified through ABS when no information is returned through the ABS or when uh, ABS is uh, called and is not returned within a reasonable time frame, uh, allowing the state to then complete an ex parte renewal without a further verification of assets. Um, the Next strategy on the slide is uh, related to fair hearings. Uh, recognizing the potential for uh, a high volume of fair hearings, uh, this flexibility allows states to temporarily extend the time frame to take final administrative action on fair hearings. Uh, one very important caveat, uh, in order to use this option in a manner that does protect beneficiaries, states would be required to uh, provide benefits and in the outcome of the fair hearing decision, including reinstating benefits. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the last two flexibilities that I'm gonna walk through are related to managed care. Um, and so the first one is uh, very closely tied to uh, the managed care contact information flexibility I described earlier. So uh, what I described earlier is our current policy. That current policy says that states may treat in-state contact information from, that is received from managed care plans as reliable for purposes of updating the beneficiary record, uh, provided that the state sends a notice to the address on file and provides the beneficiary a reasonable time uh, to verify that contact information. Uh, Given the high risk of procedural terminations, uh, if a state has incorrect address information during this period, uh, this E14 uh, flexibility would permit states to uh, uh, not uh, send that uh, notice to states to verify, that notice to beneficiaries to verify that contact information, rather, uh, they would be able to accept the uh, updated contact information received from the managed care plan directly as long as the state has ensured that that contact information was directly verified by the beneficiary, uh, an adult in the household or an authorized rep recognized by the plan, and that the state has uh, made sure that the information it has received is more recent than what is on file with the state. So this flexibility really just would allow the state uh, to take one step out of the process uh, and accept that managed care uh, updated contact information. And our last flexibility is related to uh, re-enrollment into managed care. And so under current policy, uh, uh, managed care contracts uh, must provide for automatic enrollment into a managed care plan uh, when individuals are re-enrolled into Medicaid after a loss of coverage of two months or less. This flexibility extends that period of two months or less to uh, up to 120 days. So between 60 and 120 days, uh, a, uh, an individual, a state could elect to uh, have uh, that uh, re-enrollment into uh, managed care uh, kick-in. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, finally, I'm gonna talk about processing return mail once the public health emergency ends. And I just wanna highlight once the public health emergency ends, since there are um, some key distinctions in terms of 
uh, what states can do uh, subject to that uh, the continuous coverage and uh, uh, stipulation from the Families First uh, Coronavirus Act that uh, Shannon spoke to. Uh, this really is speaking to processing return mail uh, once the public health emergency ends. So as general guidance for all return mail, states should attempt to contact the beneficiary and send notices to both uh, the current address and file and the forwarding address uh, if they have it. States should also attempt to locate uh, an enrollee by checking other data sources for updated address information. Uh, it's also important to note that states are expected to take different actions depending on the type of return mail they receive. That is, uh, whether it's an in-state address, an out-of-state address, or if there is no address information on the return mail that they receive. This is because uh, receipt of return mail indicates a potential change in circumstance that may impact eligibility, that is state residency. Uh, so starting with return mail with an in-state forwarding address, I wanna highlight that this information is not an indication of a change impacting eligibility. As such, a state may not terminate coverage for failure to respond to a request to confirm an in-state address change. A state may though accept the information provided that it sends a notice to the current address on file. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so moving to uh, out-of-state addresses. So for mail returned with an out-of-state address, I wanna highlight that this information is an indication of a change that may impact elig eligibility. However, return mail does not necessarily mean a move out of state or that a beneficiary is ineligible. As such, a state must send a notice uh, to the beneficiary to confirm continued residency. If the beneficiary does not respond or doesn't establish uh, residency, uh, the state must move to provide advance notice of termination. Again, this guidance is related to uh, once the PhD ends and not during the PhD for states that uh, are uh, claiming that uh, enhanced 6.2% uh, FMAP. Uh, finally, uh, uh, in instances of return mail with no forwarding address being received by the state, uh, the state may terminate coverage on the basis of whereabouts unknown. Uh, I will note, uh, we do encourage states to locate beneficiaries whose mail is returned to the state without a forwarding address. Um, and additionally, additionally, I will note that if a state does terminate coverage for whereabouts unknown and the individual's whereabouts become known before their renewal date, the state uh, must reinstate their coverage. Um, so I am going to stop there and pass it back to Shannon. Thanks, and if we can go to the next slide, please. So in addition to the strategies that Joe has laid out, um, we are of course also um, highlighting a number of strategies that have been available to states. Um, they aren't available you know, just during the public health emergency, but there are classic strategies that we know states can use to help mitigate churn and promote continuity of coverage. Some of these may seem pretty familiar to you, such as providing continuous eligibility for children, um, there's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's a new state plan option for states to provide pregnant individuals who are enrolled in Medicaid and CHIP with 12 months of continuous postpartum coverage that we're encouraging states to adopt. States also have various options that can streamline the renewal process to make it easier for beneficiaries um, and improve the number of beneficiaries that they can renew based on the available information. So, for example, states can always choose to increase the number and type of data sources that they're using during renewal. So they have more information and are more likely to renew coverage for more individuals. Next slide, please. And another key area that we've been working on is related to different communication and outreach strategies for individuals. So you know, states in general must communicate with 
enrollees based on their individual election and preferences to how they would like the state to communicate with them. But we are really encouraging states to think creatively and explore a number of options and a variety of outreach strategies. So this does include working with stakeholders. We have been encouraging states to work with their managed care plans to really engage beneficiaries. But we also want states to not only work with their managed care plans, but engage other stakeholders who are likely to have better relationships with beneficiaries, you know, such as local Indian healthcare providers, um, and you know, work with them to really help um, leverage um, these relationships and encourage beneficiaries to make sure that their contact information is updated as well as um, you know, really working with stakeholders to get the word up, out about what to expect once the unwinding period begins. Next slide, please. And then in addition to um, you know, engaging with other stakeholders and managed care plans, we're also working with states um, to encourage them to update their messaging. You know, as I mentioned, our Office of Communications is really seeing you know, messages that states and stakeholders can use to help prepare beneficiaries for the unwinding period. But this is also a good opportunity for states to really review their notices and the notice language that they have to make sure that the information that they normally provide to beneficiaries is clear and in a format that meets the needs of the individual. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, I know we're ready to move on to Q&A very soon, but just wanted to mention and note that we're also, um, and especially others in CMS, are really working on how we can facilitate seamless coverage transitions. Because we just know that, you know, despite all of the work to reach out to beneficiaries, some individuals um, have had changes in their circumstances and they now may be eligible for other forms of coverage. And we wanna make sure that those individuals who may be leaving the Medicaid and CHIP programs are able to seamlessly transition over to the marketplace um, or the other coverage program. And so it's important that, you know, states are, uh, making sure that they're transferring the individual's accounts over to the new coverage program and that it includes all of the information that is needed such as um, you know updated contact information so that um, you know not only can the individual get the information that they need to transition but that um, you know the marketplace and these other coverage programs can come in and really help do additional outreach to make sure that those individuals do enroll in coverage and that they maintain some form of coverage even if they no longer qualify for Medicaid or CHIP. Next slide, please. And um, I know we'll come back to this, but just, um, you know, if there's any questions, you know, after today's presentation, of course, related to unwinding, this is um, it's the CMS unwinding email that those questions can be submitted to. And of course, all of our resources are found on the unwinding page I walked through at the beginning of the presentation, which is located at www.medicaid.gov slash unwinding. And that's where we will release updated resources related to unwinding. And I think with that, if we go to the next slide, I think we're ready for questions. So I'll turn it back to Michaela. Yes, thank you everyone. Now is the time that we will have for questions. So if you could please enter all questions into the Q&A box. This is different than the chat box. So it's the Q&A that's right next to the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, so you can put all questions in that. And then you can also use the raise hand icon, which is at the bottom of your screen. And we can have you unmute your line to ask your question out loud. So now we'll take the next few minutes to answer questions. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Suzette Sang, and I am the um, uh, Acting Director of the Division of Enrollment Policy and Operations, and I will be uh, helping to lead the Q&A. So I will ask the question, and uh, our team will try to respond to all of your very thoughtful questions. So. I think first, maybe I can start off by um, saying that there have been a lot of questions about um, a recording of this call and the slides that we presented. Um, so I think that those will be, um, and maybe Beverly can help me where they will be at, but they will be posted to CMS's, um, the AIA and webpage, I think. There'll be a recording and we, we will post um, or have links to um, these slides, not as they were presented today because they were sort of mishmashed from a, a couple of presentations we presented to states, but we will uh, provide those full links to those full decks for you all. 
Yes, you're correct. You gave the correct information. Oh, fantastic. Oh, good me. Good for me. Okay. Um, kicking off some of the questions here. Um, the first couple, Shannon, maybe you can help answer. Um, the first question we have is, Will all beneficiaries receive notice of renewal requirements from the state? No exceptions, simply every beneficiary? So in general, um, states must conduct renewals of eligibility for all program enrollees. Now, during the unwinding period and really any time a state does a renewal, what a beneficiary is getting may look a little bit different depending on how the renewal process goes for them. So for some individuals, if a state has enough information to renew their eligibility, they may simply just get a notice that says your eligibility is continued, you're going to continue to maintain coverage. For other individuals, that notice may be a renewal form or a request for information, which means that the individual needs to take action. So yes, generally speaking, all individuals will need a renewal, but what that notice looks like for them may be a little bit different. Thank you, Shannon. Um, next question. Um, with the patients that have been doing their due diligence during the PHE, that show over income and normally would have their cases closed, will they be obligated to pay back the services paid? No, uh, they will not. Um, we, that is part of the requirement in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act is that all Medicaid beneficiaries who are enrolled as of or after March 18th of 2020 must maintain enrollment through at least the end of the month in which the public health emergency ends. Um, so states were obligated to keep those individuals covered. Um, even if they otherwise would have been ineligible, um, you know, during the non-public health emergency times. And states will need to renew their eligibility um, again during the unwinding period before they can take action on that old eligibility determination. Thank you, Shannon. Um, the next question um, I will attempt to answer myself. Um, will states be able to use social media to reach individuals if their addresses have changed? So maybe I'll answer generally first. Uh, CMS is working very closely with states and stakeholders. Um, as Joe, I think, outlined in the presentation, one of the big things we, we are cognizant of is that individuals haven't been renewed in quite some time, and states should do everything they can to locate um, and update contact information prior to the end of the public health emergency. So we know that states have um, begun planning or have already deployed um, media campaigns uh, to inform their beneficiaries about updating their addresses, about their renewal process that is before them. Um, but the, there is some more work being done by CMS and states in terms of like the social media texting aspect of something. So we are working with the FCC to ensure that we are following all of the laws to be able to message individuals if possible um, through text messaging. But to say overall, states are planning and deploying um, larger outreach strategies, including the use of social media. Hope that addresses that question. Um, the next question, um, how will CMS oversee that states are complying with CMS guidance and actually promoting con continuity of coverage? In the state of Idaho, the state has disenrolled 21,000 members through the course of the PHE despite receiving the additional 6.2 FMAP rate. Will CMS be requiring states to consult con, to conduct tribal consult, consultation on their plans to unwind the PHE prior to initiating their eligibility and enrollment efforts? So I'll take that maybe in two parts to say CMS is working really closely with states to ensure compliance um, with the, the rules of the FFCRA um, and all of our you know established eligibility and enrollment rules. Um, and in terms of the unwinding plans, I will say as outlined in our show letter, uh, states are not required to, to states are required to um, create a plan. They are not required to submit it to CMS unless requested. So there's no formal process for submission um, or tribal consultation. However, we have been strongly encouraging states to share those plans uh, with tribes and other stakeholders as they develop those plans um, to get input. Um, into how best to unwind and protect individuals. Um, the next question, um, yes, this one of Shannon. Um, are all renewals done by paper means or is there any online renewals being done? Yes, there should be online renewals being done. Um, 
renewals, individuals should be able to complete the renewal process. Um, either they can do it by mail if they want, by paper, um, online, also by phone, um, and of course, you know, in person as well. So, um, you know, there should be opportunities to complete the renewal process through, through different methods in all states. Thank you, Shannon. Um, there were a couple of questions about how um, individuals um, experiencing homelessness um, or without a physical ad address um, will be impacted. Um, and I'm going to turn to my colleague, Sarah O'Connor, to respond to these. Thanks, Suzette. Yes. Um, uh, we're happy to report that in our conversations with states and stakeholders, there's quite a bit of focus and attention being placed on this vulnerable population. I think um, now, as with other times outside of the public health emergency, having a valid address or a mailing address where the individual can receive correspondence from the Medicaid agency is critical, um, especially given that these individuals are not exempt from the renewal requirements at, at the end of the public health emergency. Um, so like with renewal forms that can be uh, provided online or by phone, um, when an individual completes an application, they can elect to receive notices electronically. So perhaps many of these individuals, rather than receiving notices by mail, have elected that option to receive it electronically. Um, there are also uh, campaigns going out to try and uh, encourage individuals to provide an updated address where they can receive correspondence. Um, states are looking at ways uh, within the flexibilities that we've provided in the unwinding state health official letter to renew eligibility without necessarily needing to reach out to, con to um, collect additional information from individuals. One of the strategies that Joe described was renewing eligibility for individuals who, uh, for whom a no income is returned. And we are hopeful um, that perhaps many of those individuals who are fall into that category will be able to be renewed and that potentially um, many of the individuals experience home, experiencing homelessness who don't have income and would otherwise not be able to be renewed on that basis will fall into that, to that group. So um, all of this is to say that the most important thing is to have updated contact information um, or otherwise an ability to receive notices from the state agency. So um, like I said at the top of this um, comment, many states are thinking about this and are really trying to pay attention to ways and strategies to get that contact information now. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sarah, Sarah we have a hand raised too, oh, if you'd sure. like to address. Okay, so okay. Elliot, I'm gonna unmute your line if you would like to ask your question out loud. Thank you very much. Does, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, wonderful, thank you very much. Um, just wanted to take a few minutes here at the end of the hour. Thank you very much for the presentation and for all your work with the states uh, to provide them with these flexibilities. Um, you know, maintaining Medicaid uh, eligibility is hugely important for the Indian health system. Uh, the CMS um, Tribal Technical Advisory Group has created a um, work group to, to, to focus specifically on these unwinding issues and policies. And um, one of the things we've done is we've identified a, uh, a CIB, a CMS Information Bulletin back from um, uh, November 28, 2016, which was really kind of uh, provided in the wake of uh, the expansion of Medicaid, and it provides tools for states that states can use to expand Medicaid eligibility and to increase enrollment in Medicaid for American Indians and Alaska Natives. And some of the tools identified there we think would be really useful in bringing forward during this unwinding um, uh, provision uh, uh, period for states. For example, states can give tribes access to their data portals, which has been very useful in the past. Um, and the SIB also identifies that states can actually share their enrollment and eligibility um, uh, information with tribes so long as personal health information is, is protected, of course. So tribal communities and tribal health care providers are really the community health providers in their communities. 
and know and understand the people they're serving. So they're a really good ally to states in terms of reaching out to folks who might not be able to be found in order to make sure that people aren't being dropped off of Medicaid, not because they're no longer eligible, but because they don't get a piece of, you know, they don't return a piece of mail or, you know, they're not being, uh, uh, they're not being, uh, you know, having, uh, getting the right kind of outreach they need in order to maintain that eligibility. So we're hoping that CMS can encourage um, states and uh, tell states that they can work with tribes in this way. Um, and so I just encourage you to kind of keep an eye on the work that that CMS uh, Tribal Technical Advisory Group on Unwinding uh, comes up with um, uh, in your future efforts in, in communicating with the states. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for that, Elliot. And I think a number of us um, on this call are, are, are part of that work group. And so we will be sure to, to take that into account as we continue our work with states. I know we are at time. I'm going to turn to Kitty maybe for one um, second to, to address a, a coverage question that came up, a spa question. There are a few other questions we didn't get to, but we will find a way to respond. Maybe I can just respond quickly to one question that was, is, I'm sorry if I use the patchwork word. Um, it is, we combined a couple of presentations today for the um, purpose of time, but uh, really I think we presented all of the content that it was important regarding unwinding our show letter um, and all of the flexibilities we're offering states but definitely we'll provide the full um, decks so you have those and happy to answer questions as we move forward. Uh, I'll turn it to Kitty now. Hey, thanks, Suzette. Um, there were a couple questions about coverage gaps and a lot of the work that the states are doing now are conducting assessments of the type of services they would like to see continued even on a temporary basis and then those that they want to make permanent. And we do encourage tribes to work with their states um, on those uh, potential services and let the states know which services you'd like to see continued. Um, but please remember there are there's different processes and we presented information at the March TTAG meeting about the um, continuation of the disaster relief spas and how states can submit spas through an expedited approval process for temporary services. And then of course, the spa uh, process for permanent spas, which does require the state to consult with tribes prior to submission. Um, spas are retroactive back to the date of the uh, beginning of the quarter when, when they're submitted. So we are hoping that there will not be coverage gaps, but we will continue to work with tribes on this issue. And we see this webinar, and I just want to give a big shout out to Shannon and Joe and Suzette and, and Sarah for participating on today's call. We see this All Tribes call as just the beginning of our conversation on Medicaid unwinding. So we can certainly plan on having a, another call, perhaps on the spa process. And I think in particular on outreach as the Office of Communications continues to update um, its communication toolkit. And as we work through the issues on the unwinding TTAG work group on how data can be shared, um, issues around mailing um, and post um, office delivery in Indian country, we know that it can be challenging and a little bit different from uh, those who like us who reside on the East Coast. So there is plenty more work to be done and uh, we really appreciate everybody's participation today. Thank you, Kitty, and thank you, colleagues from CMS, from the Depot Division. We want to also thank all of our participants for today. Thank you for taking the time out to join us. Um, there's, as you see the slide here, um, that provides resources and contact information um, to contact, uh, if you have questions on Medicaid unwinding, contact the information on this slide. Also, as always, you can submit inquiries to the CMS Division of Tribal Affairs at our mailbox. That can be found at tribalaffairs uh, at cms.hhs.gov. And again, a um, recording of this webinar will be posted at our website, and that can be found at go.cms.gov slash AIAN. Thank you so much, and have a great afternoon.